Romans chapter 15, we're nearing the end of this book. We've been in all year. A book about the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and how it's not just, not just a, a doctrinal truth, it's a practical reality. It's a truth that changes our lives. And when we've received Jesus, we get down to chapter 15, it's practical. If we've received Jesus and he's received us, then we should receive each other. We should love one another. We should care one for another. This morning we're looking today in the, in the scripture that the Christian life is not a solo journey. There's no Lone Ranger Christian. It's not something we walk alone. We have the Lord, but also it's a community endeavor. We build each other up. We pray for each other. We care one for another. In Romans chapter 15, the Apostle Paul moves from the gray matters to what really matters. And it's all about Jesus. Amen. In context, context, Romans 14, 17, the reminder is not to get caught up in the small stuff. Not to focus on the things that divide, but the things and, and the one who unites. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Here's what it's really all about. Righteousness, joy, and peace in what the Spirit only can provide. Let's not get caught up in the color of the carpet, although uh, this is not my favorite color. If it was my choice, everything would be the color of my truck around here. That's not a Duke blue. It's a Wilson Christian Academy blue, okay? PCC blue. But it's not what our favorite colors are. It's not what our preferences are. It's all about Jesus. And if you focus on Christ and his gospel, now we begin to grow together. Now we begin to go together in Christ. Romans chapter 15, if you found your place, would you stand for the reading of God's word? Romans chapter 15, Apostle Paul now is connecting the two thoughts. Verse 1, we then that are strong ought to bear, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, and this was the scripture that Noel read in Psalm 69, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, Psalm 69 and everything that Jesus endured, were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number seven, wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Thank you for standing and may be seated. I want to draw your attention to that final command, the final phrase in that prayer of Paul to receive one another. It's a command. We are to receive one another. The word has the idea of taking to oneself. In fact, it's used specifically with food, with fellowship, with spending time with one another. Our class, we like to call the taco class because we talk a lot, but we're having a taco fellowship after the service, and then those things are a part of fellowship. Uh, someone said belly ship. I don't know if that's the case, but at time together, two fellows in the same ship. Uh, we're all on the journey. In fact, it's used that way in Acts 27, 26, when that storm of Eurachlodon, when they were uh, all tied together with the anchors, they took meat. That's the idea. They took meat on the boat. They, they spent time uh, focusing and fellowshipping on what was in front of them. And then again, in Acts 28, uh, those on Malta, verse number two, received those that came from the vessel that had sunk. You know, in our Christian life, in our experience, there's just sometimes we're just kind of have to set anchor and focus and feast on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we have July Jubilee services. To focus on what's important. That's why we go out soul winning together. That's why we have prayer time together. Because if we're not careful, the flesh, the devil, and the world will divide and conquer and ruin hearts, souls, and minds. We are to receive one another. We're going to care those that are 
coming from difficult backgrounds were to care for them like those on Malta did uh, there at that time in, 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 Acts, in Acts chapter 28. Uh, we ought to set sail and, and do the things and set anchor and care one for another. This, listen, the book of Romans doesn't close with all of these admonitions to cloister yourself away and memorize every ism and schism out there and theologically get every debate down pat. That's not the application of Romans, but sadly, I think some camps like to think that it is. To go into the intricities of superlapsarianism and to debate it in such a way where it's ad nauseum. In fact, it's the exact opposite. We are not to, to, to receive those that are weak in the faith into doubtful disputations. The book of Romans has resulted in, sadly, many debates that will never be solved this side of glory. But the result and purpose of the book of Romans was not for us to debate and divide each other, but for us to draw close together. Draw close to the Lord and focus on the reality that you needed righteousness and I need righteousness and He only through His gospel gives me righteousness and the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Amen. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, but God commendeth His love toward us Amen. in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The wages of our sin was death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That if you, that if me, that whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. And if you really believe the gospel, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross, that we're all in this together, that everybody has been given the same spirit, you've got the Holy Ghost in you if you're saved, I've got the spirit of God in me, and the same spirit that's in you that's doing a work is doing a work in me. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the, the sun and the world and Jupiter and Mars. But how, how loving and patient he must be, right? Because he's still working on me. There ought to be a sign of my heart in your heart. That's, that kid song is true. And we believe it. We know it's by grace and mercy. But it's not just belief, it's behavior. So we get to chapter 15. We, we draw together and apply this truth. We ought to receive one another. There ought not to be a church that's filled with cliques and criticisms. Amen. There ought not be a, be a church that is filled with the, the minor issues and preferences of life. It ought to be filled and focused on Jesus Christ and his gospel. Amen. The phrase one another appears about 59 times in the New Testament. Around 50 of those occurrences are specific commands for Christians. Consider a few. Colossians 3.16, we are to admonish or teach one another in all wisdom. Galatians 6 verse 2, we are to bear ye one another's burdens. So Colossians 3.16, Galatians 6.2, Romans 12.10. Earlier here, we see here, we are to devote ourselves one to another. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, we're to build up one another. 1 Corinthians 12.25, we're to care for one another. We're to comfort one another, edify one another, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. We are to confess our faults one to another and pray one for another that we may be healed, James 5.16. Hebrews 10, 24, we are, to, we are to consider one another and provoke one another unto love and to good works. Galatians 5.15, we're not to be consumed of one another. We're not to envy one another, Galatians 5.26. We're not to provoke one another, Galatians 5.26. Philippians 2.3, we're to esteem one another better than ourselves. Ephesians 3.13, we mentioned this, uh, we are to ex exhort one another daily, every day, give somebody an encouragement. 1 John 1, 7, we are to have fellowship with one another. Colossians 3, 13, we're to forbear one another and forgive one another. Colossians 3, 13, we're to forgive one another. 1 Peter 5, 14, we're to greet one another with a holy kiss. Now that's going to be interesting. You come to me, shake my hands, don't try to kiss me, but <laughs> we're not to grudge against one another. James 5, verse 9, 1 Peter 3, 8, we're to live in harmony one with another. We're hospitable one to another. There's so many here clothed in humility to another. Do not judge one another. Be kind one to another. Don't lie to each other. Love one another. Minister one to another. Be at peace with another. Don't be puffed up against another. Prefer one another in honor. Pray one for another. Ephesians 6, 18. 
receive one another here in the text as Christ has received you. And that's only scratching the surface. How'd you do in that test? Out of of 50, out of the ones I read, does that describe your life? Because somebody who's been saved by the gospel of God, somebody who believes that the ground is love at the foot of the cross, foot of the cross, and we're all sinners, saved by God's grace, saints made righteous, perfected now, sanctified by the Spirit towards glory, made more like Jesus every single day, less like ourselves. It's a work. If we believe that, right. we're going to behave a different way one to another. Amen. How'd you do? When's the last time you prayed for somebody? When's the last time you were hospitable without grudging? When's the last time you received one another as Christ received you? No strings attached. Aren't you thankful for the grace and mercy of God? He's received us. He opened his arm and said, come unto me all you are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Learn of me for I'm meek and lowly of heart and you will find rest under your souls. So how do we do this? How do we obey God's command with the one another's? And specifically, when it comes to receiving one another as Christ received us. Notice, first of all, this is a responsibility. It's our responsibility. Verse number one. Maybe last week you were listening to the message and you said, well, I think I'm the strong brother. There's the weak brother and then there's the strong brother. A lot of times people that think they're the strong brother are actually the weak brother. Especially if you have different guardrails and standards in your life to protect you. But many times people will consider themselves at least strong in one particular area. It's like Galatians, ye which are spiritual. Well, I'm spiritual. I'm not like that worldly person or or that one that fell into sin. Ye which are spiritual. What does it say in Galatians 6? Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself lest you be tempted. So if you're really spiritual, you'll do the Spirit's work. That's conforming us to Christ. That's challenging and coming alongside. So if you think that you're strong, well, I'm a strong brother. If you're strong, you ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not just to please yourself. If you're strong, then it says not just the strong, but let every one of us. You say, well, I'm just the weak brother, so I, I don't have to bear somebody else. I got, I got too much to bear myself. Well, you're not let off the hook. Notice verse number two, let every one of us. This is even harder to do. Please his neighbor for his good to edification. Now, that doesn't mean to be in a man pleaser in the sense of doing whatever somebody else wants to do, but it does mean this, that you and your interaction with others focus on this truth and reality and practice. I'm going to interact with other people in such a way not to tear them down, but to build them up. Is that your decision? To build somebody up edification? For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Here's our responsibilities. Number one, to support. Verse one, to bear the infirmities of the weak. Number two, to sacrifice, not to please ourselves. Number three, to sense, see and know what somebody else has a need of and, and serve them and help them. Number four, to strengthen for his good to edification. You say, preacher, if I live my life in such a way like that, I'll just be used and abused and taken advantage of. No, friend, you're going to have joy. You're going to have peace in the Holy Ghost. Amen. You're going to have a sovereign strength to serve. You're going to be enabled of the Lord to live your life, not in such a way to tear people down or expect things from others, but you stepping out and being the difference that you expect from other people. Yeah. Let me ask you like this. Now, these messages, as we're getting down to Romans, are usually ones I'd reserve for Sunday night or Wednesday night. I know there are Maybe some guests here this morning, and we're glad that you're here. There may be some here that have never entered into the Christian life, and we want you to receive the gospel. We go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the Word of God, because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I want to ask you today, if every church member was just like you, what would our church look like? How would our giving be? How would our, would anybody be saved? If every church member was like you... Who would, be, who would have been greeted today and cared for? You see, here's the reality. The world gives us an eye mentality. We have an eye disease. This past week I took 
my daughter to the eye doctor. And, uh, you know, she got fitted and all that. And she's got two different sets of vision. She's got to wear the nice little patch sometimes on this side of the eye. And they, they do everything to correct the, the imperceptibilities. But here's the problem. So many times Christians get myopic. They get so short-sighted about what's in front of them and who they are. They miss out what's around them. Amen. And maybe you need to put a little patch and cover things up and get rid of the blind spots in your life and look out at a world in need. Consider it this. It's not you being, it's not, and it's not you receiving the blessing, but the question is, who can you be a blessing to? This morning, we're going to have many join our church, and the question is this, are you, are you going to care for them like, like you wanted to be cared for? Are you going to get to know them and pray for them and be a part of their life, or are you just going to expect somebody else to do that? It's our responsibility. If you do this, the word is ought. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. If you're a strong believer, you ought to support, to sacrifice, to sense, and to strengthen. Now, here's what happens a lot of times. Uh, I love what Brother Norman was talking about how the Christian army, uh, we're, we're the worst. We like to shoot our wounded a lot of times, don't we? Here's what it means to bear the weak. It doesn't mean that, well, I got to put up with you. You're my brother in Christ. You're my sister. So we're just going to have to go along and get along. That's not what it means. I don't know how many folks have ever been to the Grandfather Mountain, but up the top, they've got uh, the Mile High Bridge. And I, I've never known why they call it the Mile High Bridge, because you can look down about 65, 70 feet, and there's the ground. But there's some people who get on that, uh, you, you would think that uh, they were going through the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And they begin to walk. Now, if you really want something like that, uh, Eno State Park in Hillsborough actually has a swinging bridge. And it's especially fun if somebody's at the end of the bridge and you begin to jump on the other side of it. Um, I may or may not have done that with my sister uh, drumming up when we were hiking. But nevertheless, uh, when we get on that bridge, if you're walking with somebody that you care about and you love, or really anybody, unless you're a complete sociopath, and you jump on the bridge while your sister's walking... If some people need the guardrails, I mean, they, 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 they're going like this. They're, I mean, they're praying. I mean, they're, they're going through the whole, the whole issue and you're walking behind them. If you've ever been uh, some places like that glass bottom area uh, and, and the Grand Canyon or some of these other places, people who are afraid of heights. How many folks are afraid of heights? All right. Um, anybody just love heights? Okay. All right. We know who to sign up now to change the lights. There we go. So I'll sign up for that ministry. <laughs> We're ready for that. I'm, I'm ambivalent about it. As long as I can assess the situation and I see that it's safe, I can walk right through it. I don't need the guardrails. I've hiked enough. I've gone long enough. I know where I'm going. I was, of course, this was kind of a reputation where I would do, the, I did the angels landing area uh, up to that spot. You know, we went up to that spot in that corner and went through different areas. You didn't go all the way towards the end of that, but I've done all these different uh, hikes and uh, areas across the country and uh, around the world. And then uh, I was kind of talking about it and, you know, George even put a t-shirt or wanted to have a t-shirt saying, I survived a hike with Pastor Shakur. Amen. <laughs> and I was like, this is great. We can market this and get it out. But the, the value of that t-shirt uh, dropped drastically. Uh, when I was running around uh, Wilson Lake, or, or Snake Wilson, and uh, you know, I, was, I was running around Wilson Lake, and I fell on my face, rolled over, and scraped the entire left side of my body. So that, that's not, to say you survived a hike with Pastor Shakur means absolutely nothing right now. But if you go with me, I'm not afraid of, crazily afraid of heights. But there are those that need the guardrails. There are those that are uncertain on such a bridge. They tremble, they inch along, they may even get down on their hands and knees and crawl across the bridge. What do we do? Come on, get up there. What's wrong with you? Nothing to be afraid of. No, you don't do that. If your children are walking across that bridge, you, you bear them up. That's what the text means. Those that are struggling and weak, that may need some extra rails, may need some extra guarding, may need some crawling, may not be as developed or growing where you're at, what is our responsibility? To run out in front of them, make fun of them? No. It's to bear them up. It's to encourage them along. Do you realize this today, that, that you're not at the, the, the mark, maybe as somebody else uh, across, the, uh, across the, the, the church this morning. You may not be at the same level spiritually, but, but being where you're at spiritually in the Lord, in your strength, is not to look down at those who are not where you are, but you are to bear them up. That's what the text is talking about. Number, number one, we see this is our responsibility. Number two, it's our conformity. 
I shared something last night about Margaret Thatcher when she gave that speech about the gospel. What a wonderful speech that it was. And many times we try to take the, the, the fruit of Christianity, the fruits, and we say, let's live like, let's have love, let's have joy, let's have peace, let's have all these areas. If you separate the fruit from the root of being in Christ, the fruit will wither. The only way you're going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, this is not imitation, it's participation. The Christian life is death to self, life in Christ. You surrender yourself and your desires and you're filled with him. See, the conformity to Christ's image. How do we do this? Well, it's, it's becoming like Jesus. It's living like Jesus. What does the text tell us? Very clearly that we are, verse number three, even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. We're challenged in Scripture, but you have not so learned Christ. If you learn Christ, you learn who he was. He was not about himself. He was about others and caring for others. He came not into this world to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a, a ransom for many. It was a selfless choice. He pleased not himself. It was a sacrificial choice. The reproaches of them fell on me. You go through Psalm number 69. Uh, the Bible speaks to us. The Psalms speak for us. If you're struggling, if you don't know what to do, go to the book of Psalms. Read it out loud. Pray it. Praise it. See what happens. Psalm 69 speaks of all the suffering. But you know what it's speaking about? It's Christ. And Christ fulfilled every one of the issues that David expresses moved by the Spirit. Psalm 69 tells us that the King Jesus would be hated without cause by his enemies. He would be rejected by his own family. He would experience the deepest agony any soul could ever experience. He would be made fun of. He would be criticized by the leaders. He would be subjected to drunkenness of those that were laughing at him, drunken, and, and, and as they mocked him, as they really at, at his feet even gambled for his garments. Jesus said, I do those things to please the Father. Why do you do what you do? Jesus did it to please the Father. We know that today. If you know the gospel, you know it's true. Christ came to this world. He lived a perfect life. Think about it, 33 and a half years. But just know the reality. As a kid, he was the perfect child. He did everything right. Never talked back, never made a mistake. Think about this. As a teenager, he was a perfect teenager. As an adult, he was a perfect adult. He lay, laid down his life in perfect sacrifice. They beat him. They bruised him. They bloodied him. They put a crown upon his a thorns upon his head. They put that robe on his back and then ripped it. They mocked him and brutalized him. And he chose to do that. Why? Out of love. Christ pleased not himself. One of the beautiful parts and the main part of reality of Christianity is that Christianity is not a religion where you do something to earn God's favor. It's not a faith where you sacrifice yourself to earn heaven. Our God sacrificed himself so you can go to heaven. Amen. He gave himself. We know that today, don't you? We have not so learned Christ. We have received his mercy and his grace. We have received his love. Know that it's true. But what do we do? We still reject others. We still criticize others. We still tear them down. We still expect other people to serve us. We're never more like Satan than when we serve ourselves. We're never more than, like, than Jesus than when we serve others. I heard of a story of a mother making pancakes for her two boys on a Saturday morning. She had two boys making the pancakes. The boys started arguing about who's going to get the first pancakes. Of course, if you have kids and grandkids, you've seen this before. They're arguing about the pancakes. And she thought, well, you know, this is a perfect opportunity uh, and teaching moment to tell them about Jesus and uh, how we're, to, we're to, the one before the other. And, and she said, now you've heard me teaching this before, but if, if Jesus were here, what would he do? How would he act? What does the Bible say? And, uh, and, and one boy said, well, Jesus would do this. You know, he would, he would let my, my brother have the first pancake. She asked the, the other person, well, what would Jesus do? Well, he would let my brother have the first pancake. Well, uh, finally, the older brother looked to the younger brother and said, I've got a great idea. You be Jesus. <laughs> and that's exactly what we do every day of our life. 
Yes, I know Jesus is loving. I know he's caring. I know he's merciful. I know he, oh, he's sacrificial and caring. I want you to do that for me. I want you to give me the second chance. I'm going to give you a second chance, but I want you to give me a second chance. I don't want, I want, I don't, I don't want you to write me off, but I'll write you off. I want to receive mercy, but I don't want to give that mercy. You be Jesus. Instead of living our lives like children trying to get the first pancake, we are to live our lives as believers saved by the grace of God with others stamped on our eyeballs. There's joy. There's peace. There's righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Our responsibility, our conformity. How do we get here? Well, it's Christ-likeness. How do we get Christ-likeness? Well, it's our study. Number three, devotional, doctrinal. One day without the Bible, you'll know. Two days without the Bible, those close to you will know. A few days, a week without the Bible, everybody's going to know. The only way to make us more like Jesus Christ is to get to the Word of God and surrender to the God of the Word. Amen. The Bible's given for our instruction and for our learning, so there's doctrinal truth, there's devotional reality. Let me ask you this past week, how much time have you spent with the Lord in His Word? I'm not just talking to get through a checklist, but to discover Jesus, to spend some time in Scripture. Because if you're struggling and you're going through times of difficulty, if you came across Psalm 69 as read this morning, you would realize that there is a God in heaven who loves you and knows what you're going through. He's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and there is a purpose for your pain. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what's happening in your life, but there's a God in heaven who can take your pain and your problems, and he can work all things out together for good and for his glory. It doesn't make sense to me, but it's the truth of God's word. Amen. And I can live my life in such a way of loving the Lord and receiving his love. They devoted themselves to the doctrine. Heard of a little girl that prayed, Lord, would you please make all the bad people good and all the good people nice? Let me ask you here at Tabernacle Baptist Church, very simply put, are you nice? Well, I'm loving. I believe in Jesus. I know the gospel. Do you receive one another? On that one another's list, do you practice any of them outside your family and your own circle of influence? Everybody. Did Jesus pick a few and just exclude everybody else? Friends, he opens himself to the whole world. Now, whether they, they or they don't reconcile, they're reconciled, it's their choice to be reconciled. God's not going to force anybody, and we don't force people. But we should be open, just like Christ is. To as many as received him, to then give you power to become the sons of God. Finally, our unity. Well, I want this. this what a great, what a, this is the Lord's choice today. This is our next passage. Tonight we have communion. I used to think growing up that communion, of course, uh, we, I was filtered down from some sort of even Catholic background with a family and grandparents, things like that. We always use Lord's Supper. I used to think that communion was the term that they used for the Eucharist, and it's a wholly different thing. But the reality, the Bible uses the term communion. And communion is not you taking the body of Christ and taking of his body in you. That's not what communion is. It's you as his body demonstrating, listen, the common unity that you have. Communion is the local church demonstrating our faith in his shed blood. Yeah. Tonight we have communion. It's our common unity service. Hallelujah. Getting back to the basics. We believe that he shed his blood for us. We believe that he died for us. A substitutionary sacrificial death and only through Christ we have life. Amen. That's what communion is all about, that he died, was buried, and rose again. And we bring it back to the reality of what's most important, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's communion. So what's our unity? How do we get this unity? Number one, we see it's, it involves prayer. Verses 5 to 6 is a prayer. The Apostle Paul prays as he's praying. He breaks out in prayer in the text. He says, now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. You can't do this on your own. You've got to go to God and ask for it. You say, oh, preacher, I don't know how I can get along with that person. I don't know how I'm going to receive that person. You go to the God of patience who put up with you, the God of and consolation who encourages you, and ask him to enable you and help you love like he does. 
according to Christ Jesus, that ye with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Here it is. How are we going to be unified? Very simply put, pray together and praise together. Amen. I believe that the church should be, as Jesus said, my house should be called a house of prayer. Amen. When's the last time? That's why I love an altar call. You can grab somebody together. You can pray at the altar. You can pray at your seat. But my house shall be called a house of prayer. Who are you praying with? There is something that happens where two or three are gathered together in his name. What happens? He's in the midst. He's everywhere at the same time. But there's a manifestation of the presence and power of Christ when you're agreeing in prayer together. I can't explain it. But you, you come together and pray according to his word. He hears you. He steps in. And you know he's there. Are you praying like that? That's why the Apostle Paul says for husbands not to be bitter against their wives, but to reconcile that your prayers be not hindered. The devil's out to destroy your relationship because he doesn't want you praying together. The devil's out to divide and get us in the gray areas and get us arguing about things that really don't matter in the grand scheme of things to render a powerless church. So what do we need to do? Pray together. Are you praying together? Husbands, wives, friends, families? I've talked to folks who've been married for 60 some years and they've said they've never prayed together. You are living beneath your privileges as a born again, blood bought child of God with access to the very throne of heaven to come boldly before his throne to find grace and help in time of need. Pray together and then praise together. He inhabits the praises of his people. Amen. Here's what happens, and maybe this is just me. Y'all are perfect. But if you're not led by the Spirit, and you're in a group, or you go out somewhere, or they're over your house, if you don't spend time intentionally in prayer or in praise, here's what happens. We begin to tear people down. We begin to gripe. We begin to complain. And ultimately, we're complaining against God. So what do you do? Choose with your mouth to pray together. Choose with your mouth to praise Him. How do you do that? Well, even point out the positive things in somebody's life. Receive one another. I'm not saying today you have to go to somebody and say, hey, you know, the Lord spoke to me and I, I'm supposed to take you out to Culver's. Now, if that's you, line me up. I'll, I'll go with you. I'm not saying today that's the answer. But I am saying this, you can very at least walk out of here and not tear somebody down. Amen. At the very least, make a decision. I'm going to build them up. I'm going to go pray with them. I'm going to pray about it more than I talk about it or post about it. I'm going to praise what God's doing in their life and who they are to me. And I'm going to praise God. I'm going to get together and praise God because here's what happens when the church of the living God, listen, we're not a ragtag army singing the blues. We're, we're shouting the songs of Zion. We've been given all authority in heaven and earth to preach the gospel in the army of God, praying together, praising together, preaching the gospel together. This world can be turned upside down. You see that on Pentecost, they prayed together before the time was appointed. They spent their time in prayer. They spent that time in the upper room with one accord and one mind as they prayed the Lord and the Bible says they heard the sound of a mighty rushing wind as the Spirit of God filled that place and upon their heads appeared cloven tongues as a fire and they begin to speak supernaturally and what do they do? They praise God yeah. in other languages yeah. and people are going whoa that's my language how did they know that one? I'm not saying walk out of here and start speaking in Chinese. Use the language that you know right now. Encourage somebody else. Amen. Use the language you know right now and pray with that person. And go praise God together. And see what happens. Think about Paul and Silas. Locked up in a lockdown, beat up. They didn't just let everything roll. They had things in motion, by the way, to challenge the local government and their ordinances, but they did it respectfully, they did it right. 
but they didn't focus on that. They weren't talking about they weren't talking about the slighting of what they treated the Roman citizen at that night. They sang and praise, sang praises to God. What did God do? That jailhouse rocked, and the bands were loosed. How did Job get through his trial? What was it that brought him through? Was it the realization that God was sovereign? That wasn't it. It was when Job prayed for his friends that the tribulation turned. Maybe you need to start praying for somebody that's hurt you. Maybe you need to start praising God in the midnight hour when you're locked down and you'll be set free. Think about Jericho. The Israelites were to sanctify themselves for the Lord to do wonders among them. They marched together obediently to God's command. When the walls fell down, they had one mouth as they shouted. And the walls came a tumbling down. It's about time that we, with one mind and one mouth, inner and outer, Focus on Jesus Christ. That's why we have July Jubilee. That's why we invite other pastors in this area. That's why we invite national pastors and fly them in. So we, with people across the country and churches around this area, with one mind and one mouth, can glorify God. Can I tell you where the services that I've sensed the presence of the Lord the most has been at July Jubilee services here at Tabernacle? This fall, we're going to Romania. It's a beautiful country. It's a country rich with heritage. It's a country that suffered under the grasp of communism. The dictator of Romania, Nikolai, I won't try to say his last name, built in the heart of Bucharest, the capital city of Romania, the second largest administrative building, the Palace of the Parliament. This dictator with communism behind him with part of Russia took the money from the people to build this massive complex that just continuously money was poured into. Second largest in the world is a vanity project. Crystal chandeliers, marble mosaics, 1,100 rooms. It's a mark of narcissism and pride. Romanians suffered through a bleak period of poverty and repression. It was a horrible time. To raise money for it, they actually gathered the churches and wanted to give part of the tithe money toward the churches. And they wanted the churches to support and have their fidelity to the Soviet Union and to communism. One by one, the church leaders stood up. And as the church leaders stood up, one by one, they were giving fidelity to communism and the Soviet Union. When it came down to Richard Wurmbrand, Richard looked at his wife and he said, I don't, I don't know what to do. Sabina said, you get up. They, they are spitting on the face of Jesus. You need to get up and wipe the shame from the face of Jesus. Amen. These people that are compromising their churches for communism, you need to stand up and you need to do something about this. And he looked over and said, now, if, if I do that, you're going to probably lose your husband. And she looked back at him and said, but I don't need a coward for a husband. He stood up that day, Richard Wurmbrand. There was a hush as he declared to all the people that were there, were 4,000 people, that it was their duty to glorify God and Christ alone. They hustled him from that platform. They changed his name. They threw him into a prison. He was tortured for 14 years. I was reading some of the torture. Uh, I encourage you to read the book, Tortured for Christ, true story. He was put in this place of shame and blame. His wife was taken away, hidden, told her husband was dead. They tortured him on a regular daily basis. And instead of being bitter at his wife for putting him up to it, instead of being bitter at the government, and he decided to look around him and encourage other people around him. There are many stories of how Richard was used in that prison cell. But the one that moved me was there was one person who was a Christian, but had stood up and denied the Lord and put others in danger. And guess what they still did? They didn't trust him, so they threw him in prison anyways. Here's a man, he's denied the Lord, he's put other in danger. None of the other Christians wanted to talk to this guy. There was Richard. Richard came to him, prayed with him, shared his meager rations with him, prayed with him for forgiveness and healing. The man recommitted his life to Christ. 
They both became sources of strength in that prison and they prayed together, praised together. And when they were released, they were used together in mighty ways to develop Voice of the Martyrs, which today goes across the world, sharing the plight of those that are even still today under the communism and rule. What's interesting about that palace, it was never finished. Actually, the dictator died before it even finished. The revolution swept through Russia. Christmas Day, they were captured and executed by a firing squad. A nice little gift for them. When the dust settled, the palace of the Parliament stood as a hollow shell, a monument to pride of a disposed dictator. The new mayor that came to Bucharest, guess what he did? Called up Richard Vermbrand. And today, in one of the basements, they're printing the Voice of the Martyrs. Amen. They're printing Torture for Christ. Can I just encourage you today, never, 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 never give up. Just pray. Amen. Can I encourage you today, you don't know who's around you that have failed and fallen. A just man falls seven times, yet rises up again. You go to that person. You which are spiritual, restore such a one. Receive one another. Care for one another. Admonish one another. We need each other. It's not all about us. I don't know how it's all going to work out. But it's about the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. And if his gospel is true and remains and Jesus is coming back again someday, then everything and everyone in our life is for a purpose. Receive one another. That person may not be the level you're at. That's okay. You just love them. Receive one another.